Nima was a medical student when we first um, started talking about tolerance. So I was his mentor and he was the medical student. And now he's gone through residency fellowship and he's now my partner. We just hired him um, as part of UCLA as faculty. So these things take a little while. Um, I actually talked, I brought up a brochure. We couldn't find it, but in 2015, uh, I think it was 2015, I gave a talk on exactly this this topic about tolerance and how in the bone marrow transplant world, matching is critical. And back then, uh, whatever it was, eight years ago, I, I mentioned that the NKR is the premier matching uh, consortium. So why doesn't it get involved in tolerance? But it's great now that I get to give this talk and now tolerance has become uh, more acceptable. And I just want to point out tolerance in any form is good. Not just immune tolerance, but tolerance in any form is good. Um, and that gets into kidney is pink and so on. This is the first kidney transplant. You guys have all seen this picture. But I want to point out the guy in the top right. He was the first living donor surgeon and apparently he took on more burden. So this is Hartwell Harrison, top right. He took on more burden than any physician ever before, they said, because he broke a um, uh, Hipp Hippocratic Oath. He did harm to a patient. So the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. Well, he actually donated uh, or did the surgery. And the only thing he could do was to harm uh, the donor. And uh, this was a big deal at the time. And um, I think we take it for granted what it takes to do pioneering things because now uh, we do living donations and the surgeons take on a big burden. Uh, but it's pretty amazing that we have a lot of donor surgeons in here and even more amazing that we have a lot of people that put their life on the line in order to, to give a kidney to a total stranger. Um, but this is where it all began. And the nice thing about that first transplant is that they were identical twins. It's like you took your kidney out of your body and then gave a kidney back to your body. And that's what it's like, identical twins. Well, immune tolerance is very similar to that. You're taking basically the bone marrow of the donor and hoping it engrafts in the recipient. And then the recipient starts making the white blood cells and recognizes the donor kidney as self. So we're trying to kind of do what that first transplant um, already did. And we followed the footsteps of um, Stanford, who did this for um, uh, well-matched siblings. And uh, Sam Strober was the pioneer for decades and decades. He worked on this and worked on this. And um, uh, we did our first patient uh, a little while ago, maybe a few years ago. He's been off immunosuppression for a couple of years. And this is when we published our first patient in Lancet. But getting patients off immunosuppression drugs is, is wonderful. Um, and this is how it kind of goes. So uh, the donor takes GCSF or plerixophore. And what that does is that mobilizes the white blood cells uh, from, from the marrow into the peripheral blood. So it used to have to be under anesthesia and you used to have to get your, your the donor would have to get a the needle into their hip and so on. Now you take these powerful drugs that basically loosens up the connections so that the CD34, uh, the stem cells release from the bone marrow and go to the peripheral blood. Uh, plerixophore is very powerful. It does this in hours. Uh, GCSF does this in days. And that's why it's not fair that they, in my opinion, that uh, plerixophore was blamed for Tolaris because they're just mobilizing uh, the cells into the peripheral blood. You're just collecting more cells. Uh, it's like bringing a truckload of fruit here as opposed to a, a wheelbarrow of fruit. Uh, it still has to be processed, and so you still have to pick out all the green apples, but you just have more. Um, and so the next slide here is when uh, you're getting phoresis, and then this year you get a bag of white cells, you get the neutrophils, you get the uh, natural killer cells, you get mono, monocytes, plasma, platelets, you get this bag, and that's what Plerixophore does. And then this is the phoresis, uh, the donor got injected, now he's getting phoresis, and then it gets separated in something called a Miltini device, and then you separate out the CD34, which is the hematopoietic progenitor stem cells, and the CD3s, which you need to help the CD34s engraft in the recipient, and they can be cryopreserved. And that's why delayed is so good, because once you cryopreserve it, you could give it to the recipient 100 years later. Uh, and then there's the donor operation, the laparoscopic donor operation, and then uh, back tabling of the kidney. And then you're seeing the uh, recipient transplantation, 
And then on post-op day one, they're off to radiation. Now, um, with the Stanford protocol and our protocol that we've made a bit of a variation on, they get the radiation on post-op day one. So it's very important you make a small incision and we do a paramedian incision instead of cutting through all the, the muscles. We just open up the fascia, quite a small incision, and uh, they feel well. In fact, often our patients don't need anything other than Tylenol to recover. So they're ready to go to radiation on post-op day one. And then they go through radiation, they go through thymoglobulin, and then they get the, the brother's uh, stem cell. So here's the infusion. And uh, here they are being celebrated at the Lakers game. So um, it was, uh, so he's been off immunosuppression. The gentleman on the right is the donor who donated his kidney and his stem cells. Uh, the recipient on the left, Andy, uh, he's off all immunosuppression for over two years now, I think. They, I like this because they announced, uh, uh, at the Lakers game. And now the first, uh, Los Angeles first immunosuppression free kidney transplant. And I could tell nobody in the audience knew what the hell was going on, but they, they, they all cheered very loudly. Anyway, here's our second pair. They were featured in the Rose Bowl. He's off all immunosuppression. Here's his wonderful sister that donated, um, kidney and stem cells to her brother. These are the Ortegas. I can say I'll show all these pictures and they've all signed uh, the HIPAA thing. So it's good. Here's Jill Rusick and her, uh, brother, the brother donated, uh, Jill was the one that received the kidney and also off immunosuppression, uh, moving back to Hawaii. Here's another wonderful pair of the Pfeiffers. His sister flew from Africa. She uh, lives in Africa, um, does uh, really meaningful work with uh, a hospital in Africa, but flew out just to do this, uh, donate her kidney and her stem cells. The Johnson brothers, real characters, great guys. They actually went to Legacy. Uh, first, and then Legacy um, referred it to, uh, to us. They actually went to Portland first. And so thank you, Legacy. And then uh, the Allison sisters. And you get all these people who get off their immunosuppression medications. And it's wonderful. So you can see our first four are off all immunosuppression. Uh, our last two here are on low-dose tacrolimnus, and they'll be off soon. They're just getting tapered. And that brings me to retroactive tolerance, which I think is the way to go forward because it opens it up to patients that have already got a well-functioning kidney transplant now. And as long as they have a donor that's still alive, well, then you can hopefully get them off immunosuppression. So we did that, transplanted a gentleman about a year and a half before. It was 14 months. And then we asked his brother to come back. So you can see on the left, the transplant is months or years ago. And then you call that same donor who donated their kidney to come on back. And that's the next little part. And come on back and donate your stem cells. So you mobilize it from the bone marrow into the peripheral blood. You forese it, separate it, cryopreserve it. And then you put the recipient who's on his immunosuppression or her immunosuppression. Uh, in this case, it was a he. Uh, and we gave him TLI. So we gave uh, radiation to the lymph nodes. And then we gave thymoglobulin. And then uh, they go for two weeks of that, basically. And then we give the infusion of stem cells. The nice thing is it's all outpatient. So you don't have to rely on operating rooms. You don't have to rely on surgeons. You don't have to rely on hospital beds. It's all done as an outpatient. And the other thing, too, is that uh, you could have a transplant done at, say, a center wherever in New York. And then they could go few months later and they could go get the retroactive um, stem cell infusion. Um, uncoupling it also opens it up to potentially deceased donors. So once we move out of kidneys, hopefully we can move to livers, hearts, and so on. And having a delay, you just can't take someone who just received a liver transplant or a heart transplant and on post-op day one, send them to radiation. You need to let them recover in the ICU, go through rehab, and so on. So the also thing, it's very similar to what we saw earlier where it's uncoupling of donor and recipients. Uncoupling the transplant from the uh, radiation, thymoglobulin, and infusion of stem cells is the way to go. They can recover from their surgery. It, it, patients are really, really anxious to get a kidney transplant, as we heard in the last talk with them. But once they have a kidney transplant, kind of the pressure is off. And so the, now we can say, okay, this is a good time for your donor to come back, maybe in the summer, uh, and, and donate their stem cells. And so they've got their kidney transplant. They just want to get off of their, their medications now. But it's not as urgent as coming off of dialysis. Now they just want to get off their medications 
as as soon as they can but we can you know work a little it's not the, there's not so much of a of a demand to get it done now so here it is so here's a small incision and this really helps and then this is Anne Raldo, Dr. Raldo, radiation oncologist, who's wonderful. This is actually the patient in the radiation machine. Uh, it looks like a mannequin, but that's actually him. Uh, and then here he is getting thymoglobulin as an outpatient in our clinic. And that's his brother who donated a kidney. And then we brought him back from Virginia. And then he donated his stem cells almost a year and a half later. And we've got very good durable chimerism. So we've checked his, his, his engraftment was excellent. And right now we've checked uh, his chimerism four times. He still has wonderful in, uh, chimerism. He's got about 36, I believe, 36% of, of donor cells circulating in his blood. And that's almost at five months out. So right now he's on about the lowest dose of tacrolimnus he could be on. And the next step is to um, uh, take him right off of all of his immunosuppression which we're looking forward to doing. When Joe Murray uh, said his Nobel Prize speech, he said, transplant has been great. And he, he gave his Nobel Prize speech in about 1990, I believe. And he said, uh, but the next Nobel Prize will be for tolerance, whoever can figure out a tolerance. And I'm glad that um, so many people are now gunning to, to do uh, tolerance and get patients off drugs because the drugs have not changed for about, 40 years. Um, and there was an incredible article in the New York Times that maybe some of you read from Silverstein, I believe her name was, who received a heart transplant. And she's like, of course, I'm grateful getting a heart transplant. But these immunosuppression drugs have been a real burden. And that's the uh, gratitude paradox. I think patients are so grateful to get a kidney that they don't want to complain about the immunosuppression drugs. But we should do better. And we should try to get these patients off their immunosuppression drugs, so they don't get horrible squamous cell cancers and heart disease and diabetes and all these things. Um, I think we can just do better. And the patients can't really complain because they got a kidney. Of course, it's better than being on a machine every other day. Uh, so it's up to us to kind of take this the next step. I'm really glad that NKR has made this a priority to get this kind of done. Um, and it's been a real honor working with these patients. It just goes to show you, you just got to try it uh, because it is possible. These patients are walking around without taking medications like you and me, and they have a transplant from their sibling. Uh, that is right. it. Thank you. Do you have any questions for Jeff? Yes. Um, have you seen any difference in the success rate between after a transplant doing the stem cell or at the same time or you know prior having the donor donate stem cells prior and yeah so the reason no one did retroactive is because they were worried that if you give the donor stem cells a year and a half later the recipient has uh, uh, preformed DSA uh, antibodies that are a memory memory DSA there so if you reintroduce the donors, stem cells, antigens, a year and a half later, the worry was they would have a profound reaction, crank up their B cells, their plasma cells, build all these antibodies, not just kick out the stem cells, but attack the kidney transplant and you would lose the living donor kidney transplant. So that's why nobody did it. Um, but uh, again, UCLA has a lot of guts. I got Before there was NKR backstopping vouchers, it was only UCLA. That first grandfather voucher was just UCLA said, well, we'll give Quinn, the grandson, a kidney when he needs it. Well, UCLA had guts on this too. They said, well, look, she should be okay because you're given radiation, thymoglobulin. The immune system should be dampened enough uh, to do it. And thank God it worked. And he's got uh, as good of engraftment as if you did it simultaneously. So his initial um, chimerism test was at 29%, then he went up to about 40% of donor stem cells, and now he's 36, 32% of, of, of donor stem cells in his circulation. So it's a beautiful chimerism, no different than if you did it simultaneously. And can you do, if the, if the initial transplant was done at another center, could patients be referred to UCLA for this procedure? Yeah, that, I guess I didn't emphasize that enough. That's why there's no like us versus them or no like... Um, uh, we're not mowing your lawn, you know what I mean? Like you're still doing the transplant 
and, and the billing and all the Medicare cost report and all the wonderful things that, that your center would get uh, would be there. But if you have two haplo well-matched siblings, you could now send them to UCLA and we can now try to get them off um, immunosuppression without, you know, it's like if a, you don't want your donor to go to UCLA or you don't want your kidney transplant to go to UCLA, you still want to do that at your center. But this is more of you want your patient to come off of immunosuppression so you could send it to us. Uh, these are our uh, two haplo siblings. So there's not that many of them, but that's, yeah, that's the hope. And then we will hopefully get engraftment and then we could send them back to you. So like this, this third person, um, she was living in Hawaii. So we refer back to Hawaii. The fourth is Portland. So they're going back to Portland. We keep them for a few months just to watch and monitor them. And then they would go back to their home center. Yeah. Have you have you guys lost chimerism in any of these pairs? And if or, or if you did, what would you do at that point with the immunosuppression, or would you try it again? Or? So our first pair that you saw at the Lakers game uh, has no chimerism anymore, and he's he's remained off immunosuppression. So there's something we don't understand. If you introduce donor cells to the recipient. Uh, it probably re-educates the recipient's immune system to be accepting. It might have to get involved with the thymus. Um, I don't think anyone really knows. Or they might have, that's just chimerism when you pull the blood. So that's peripheral chimerism. Maybe they have chimerism still at the allograft. But I get the sense that the, having the donor cells and the donor stem cells in there kind of re-educates and rewires your immune system. So even when they lose chimerism, they remain tolerant. So he remains off all immunosuppression and his chimerism is lost. And he's about two years out, no immunosuppression. Yeah, I don't think we totally understand why, but it might be chimerism maintained at the actual allograft at the kidney itself. Yeah. Are you finding insurance pays for this or for simultaneous Medicare covers. So um, Stanford, did about 30 patients on this. Unfortunately, Sam Strober, who was the force behind this, unfortunately passed. Um, and so uh, it's to my understanding, they're not doing any more, but with them doing 30 and having excellent results, and then we've done um, uh, six simultaneous, and then I think other centers through Meteor and so on, that the simultaneous is covered by Medicare. So what happens when you do it a year later? Is that The retro is pocket? not. Out of pocket by these Yeah, patients? so right now, I mean, there's, um, we're hoping to get a CIRM funding. Uh, we've had philanthropic gifts from Connie Frank, who's a very generous uh, uh, philanthropic donor. Uh, our clinic is named the Connie Frank Clinic. We've had one legacy, which is our organ procurement organization, has donated a lot of money uh, because they're hoping that this eventually moves into deceased donors and even um, uh, VCA, so vascular composite allograph with the hands, the feet, the you know, wounded warriors, um, you know, all, all kinds of face transplants, that kind of thing. So it's about $70,000 to do it, put them through radiation, giving the medications, doing the phoresis and then um, all, all, all the stuff, separation and so on. So it's about $70,000 per patient. And we've been able to do it based on one legacy uh, and philanthropic. And we're hoping for a big CIRM grant to continue this, which is the California um, stem cell. Yeah, CIRMS, California, I forgot what it stands for. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. What's been the long, long lag time between the transplant and the um, stem cell transplant? So this is the first one ever in the history of the planet. So there's only one, and it was at uh, 472 days. But the next patient we're trying is going to be at uh, almost five years. Because we think if it works at five years, you were home free. It's bound to work at nine years, 20 years. Uh, so the next one is a big test of it. And we're about to do it later this month. 